It's January 31, 2009. This is Maximize Utility. I want to do a recap of the pieces I did on Macroeconomics 2009. I don't think I brought the points out uh, very well. Anyway, the story is, or the backdrop is, we're in a recession because uh, there was a housing bubble and it burst. We were buying way too many houses at way too high prices. Interest rates were too low and people who shouldn't have been buying big houses, expensive houses, were doing so. Certain areas got way overbuilt. And when the housing bubble burst, it brought down other parts of the economy with it. And now we're trying to save the economy. And we're going to try to save it by getting people to buy more houses and get the prices of houses up and get interest rates down so we can get people to buy more houses. And it's spilling over. We want people to buy more cars, even though we bought way too many cars and way too big cars. We want people to buy and buy and buy. And the kind of greatest story is that we spent a decade, perhaps, where we were just buying too much. We were borrowing from the rest of the world. Our savings rate was very low. And now the solution is, well, buy more, spend more. Keep spending and spending and spending. That's the solution. And it's, uh, we first tried to do it with standard monetary policy, lowering the rate, but that didn't seem to work. And then we started doing special monetary policy, saving banks and other financial institutions with special lending, increasing the size of the Federal Reserve's uh, balance sheet, for example. And that didn't seem to work. So we went back to the old standby fiscal policy. We hadn't touched that in decades. And we said we'd spend our way out of it. And it started to become somewhat like a joke. And, uh, for example, in his inauguration speech, the president said, we've got to sacrifice. And then he said, I'm going to give you $100 billion here and $100 billion for this industry and $500 billion there, and there'll be more billions and more billions to come. And it also starts to look kind of Oprah Winfrey-like, that this topic today is the bad bank, uh, this topic today is a certain kind of monetary policy, oh, it's this new kind of monetary policy, it's a new facility by the Fed, oh, it's the good bank, oh, it's just leaving zombie banks, oh, it's fiscal policy, let's do tax cuts, let's do tax cuts for this group. We're going and going and going and going and going. It also starts to look, I'll say, Spanish Inquisition-like in the sense that the people who want to save the system, they are saving some kind of salvation. That they, they have a goal that it doesn't matter what they do to get there. They know their goal is right. That's it. It's, there's no question about it. It's no morality here. If we have to save bad banks and give people who made two big mortgages a break, they're going to do it because there's some salvation that we all can't seem to see, perhaps. And the people oblige. The people who are going to pay the price for this and the people who are taking the torture right now, but they seem to think that they're getting the right thing. Now, people out there who aren't professional economists, you might be averse to criticize this process because you think there's some great economic theory underlying everything. So, for example, you might see a, a picture in the financial press of Christina Rama, one of the top economists for the Obama administration, looking at the uh, report showing the Keynesian multipliers and how she's going to stimulate the economy. And you think she must have something there. Well, does she? Uh, that was my point. What do we really know about monetary and fiscal policy? So, one point I made is if you're going to do extreme macro solutions, for example, given the Federal Reserve permission to do facilities that it could never do before, why not just do micro solutions? Why not just relax rules about smoke and pot and then go out there and find the people who are suffering in this recession and say, if we give you a pot to get you to the recession, will you be as well off? You might find that they'll say, yeah, and it would be a very cheap way to solve the problem. We'll go out and hire a bunch of prostitutes for people, something like that. I know it sounds flippant, but it might be cheaper and it might be more effective. And the, another point, theatrical point I made was uh, that thing about being the baseball hero. And that's uh, my observation here, that everybody's a hero here. Everybody's saving the world. You've got Ben Bernanke saving the world. Uh, Hank Paulson, he was uh, the great leader of Goldman Sachs. Now he's trying to lead the country, and he can't figure out why it doesn't want to be saved by him, because he's so sincere. Timothy Geithner couldn't pay his own taxes, but he's going to save the world. you got the people from Barack Obama's team, Lawrence Simons, Christina Romer, are great savers. Then you got the ones in the financial press, Paul Krugman, Joe Stiglitz, Robert Schiller, Paul Volcker, Warren Buffett, uh, Bill Gross. They're all thinking about ways to save the system. Why do they want to save the system? The people who are bad in the system, they generally despise, but they're going to save them. It's all about great heroes. And, the, you know, the heroes come from the conservative side, too, though not as much, in my opinion, but someone like R. Glenn Hubbard. He's come up with more solutions to, to save the day than anyone I know. Anyway, I think all these people run a great risk of going down in history as fools. Now, I personally have racked my brains for a macro solution, but I have an immediate bad attitude. I, I don't know if I want to save the people who bought houses that were way too big who took way too big mortgages, so save the bad banks. And anyway, there's some other aspects, kind of major aspects. You've seen how there's been a great role reversal here. Usually we did policy in a very gradual way. Now we would do it really hard. We also would tell all in policy. Now we've been trying to hide the policy to some extent. And we've abandoned interest rate policy. Even great uh, economists like Frederick Michigan say interest rate policy doesn't work any longer. He says we've got to do other kinds of monetary policy. 
other major contradictions and uh, conundrums, uh, the timing of policy. It looks like the, the policy is going to take so long that we'll be in what we call the long run, but uh, that may be okay, the Keynesians say, because in the long run we're still going to be in a recession, so it's not really short run at all. Uh, there's also the issues of magnitudes. How much uh, money should we spend to save the problem? Where did we get that $700 billion figure for the top, for example? And then there's no admission of failure. No one says, oh, we didn't really know what we were doing with the top. Then there's this business about there being lots of tools that the central bank can use. But the central bank really only has one tool. It can basically go out there and lend money on the good name of the United States. And um, there's this story about doing it in a concerted way. If we do it hard and do it with conviction, it will work. The Republicans, the Democrats, the financial press, and most of the pundits, they were all behind something, doing something. But uh, did that really have any umpah to it? To summarize, um, the idea is that government policy can stabilize an unstable economy and can enhance long-run GDP growth. I think that's false. I think the government, if anything, adds instability. And I don't think it does anything to improve long-run growth. And Keynesian economics stimulation, I don't think that works. I think the Keynesian multiplier is essentially zero. I don't think monetary policy does much. I don't think it ever did, even during the uh, simpler days in the 1990s when it looked like it was very successful. I think it was just kind of going with the economy. But you might say, well, what's the harm in trying? This is a common refrain from activist policy people. What's the harm in trying? Well, there's a lot of harm. One thing is you generally put more resources in the hand of the government, and that's bad. And another thing is there's a general debt bias. You end up piling more and more debt. Another thing is there's a potential for much higher inflation. And so you'll end up giving your future generations more debt and higher inflation, and they'll have to go up against the Chinese and the Indonesians and the Latvians and so on with higher taxes and a uh, higher rate of inflation. Uh, that will be disadvantageous. Also, I think there's a great, great moral hazard aspect of having the government all over the place. The businesses say, banks are saying right now, let's not do anything, wait for the government to cut us a break. So, uh, what's the solution? I mean, there's the flippant micro solution, go out there and give them women, and give them marijuana, and give uh, facelifts to the women who are suffering in the recession. But I think now is a good time to do sound microeconomic policies, and we'll talk a lot about these microeconomic policies, and they range from things like decriminalizing marijuana, to cashing out Social Security. Now would be a great time to cash out Social Security.